we decide which buildings are worth saving and which ones aren't in regards to a building's design significance. This is one that was recently saved. Well, sort of. It's the Portland Building in Portland, Oregon. What about it made it significant enough to be worthy of saving? This despite the fact that it is almost universally unliked by the public. What's its story, and what does it teach us about what we value in architecture? It was designed in 1979 by the architect Michael Graves. You might know Graves from his teapot designs and other goods for sale at Target a few decades ago. Michael Graves passed on about five years ago, and he was an important presence where I went to graduate school at Princeton University. His work began like a few others of his generation, as ardent followers of Le Corbusier. Early on in his career, he designed houses as abstract white boxes, with planes that seemed to drift away from the enclosure that they're supposed to be providing. One architect, commenting on Graves' work, said that he did Corbusier better than Corbusier himself. But this was 40 years after the Villa Savoie, that groundbreaking modernist masterpiece, and Michael Graves was searching for his own path. After a lot of sketching and experimentation at the office, in 1977, he designed the Plocek House in New Jersey. It looks like an off-kilter, abstracted building from Renaissance Europe. But instead of being made of stone, the house is made of wood and stucco. The stucco provides a smooth coating over shapes, structured with the wood which can make almost any shape. The Plocek House is made of shapes that reference familiar pieces of historical architecture, even though they don't provide the same function. An arched window, for instance, when made of stone, takes the shape to accommodate structural forces. Out of stucco, though, the window is purely about referencing those historical elements. So the building becomes an assemblage of architectural elements that are no longer tied to their role in construction, rather only as flattened shapes that remind you of other architecture, drawing on your memories of the past and speculating on how and why they've come to land in this new configuration in the Plocek House. About two years after that house was constructed, Michael Graves, at the age of 46, won a competition to design the Portland building. The competition called for the design of a 40,000 square foot tower to house governmental offices for the city of Portland. It is about 10 times larger than the Plocek house, and it has an important civic role and program. But Graves wanted to test those ideas that he was developing at the house at a larger scale in a larger scale building. Three years after winning that competition, this building was complete, on time and under budget. Part of what made this tight time frame and budget-friendly solution possible was the invention by Graves to make a building that uses familiar parts of architecture, but doing so with inexpensive materials. And because these elements are no longer tied to their material and performative limitations, they're free to be applied, transformed, and collaged at will. Within the flat surfaces of the building, all kinds of things are communicated, almost like a painting or a picture. The style here developed where Michael Graves was asked to design a pretty normal building where the traditional terms of architectural design excellence could no longer apply. Expensive materials and grand spaces, they're simply not possible here. So the question is, how could architects develop a new mode of design that embraces these limitations and maybe even celebrates them? Today, around 40 years later, and buildings like this tend to look old or dated or garish or even offensive. Many would be surprised, or at least it would confirm that architects are silly to hear that the building actually won an award from the American Institute of Architects in 1983. But in October 2009, Travel and Leisure magazine called the Portland building one of the most hated buildings in America. Despite this, in 2011, the building was nominated by a local architect and was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. The nominating architect cited the significance of this building as the important early example of postmodern architecture, as well as its pivotal and important role in the career of Michael Graves, who would go on to be an internationally significant architect. In addition to just getting the building the recognition that it deserves, the nominators believe that bringing this kind of attention to the building would shame the city into taking better care of this recognized structure. And it worked, sort of. The city raised nearly $200 million for a comprehensive renovation, which included new windows, turning the dark and opaque glass to lighter and more transparent ones. It also featured metal panel rain screen system that goes on the exterior. And then it also includes seismic reinforcing for the structure. The renovation was recently completed earlier this year.
Ironically, now the building faces the possibility of being delisted from the very list that may have saved it in the first place. After an architectural audit of the renovations, they deemed that the altered appearance of the building was too radical and intrusive, and that it doesn't any longer retain any of its historical significance. I guess it's the danger of architecture that relies too heavily on appearance to achieve its architectural effects. But either way, this seems like a complicated issue, so I wanted to dig a little bit deeper to understand how these kinds of decisions are made. How and why are some buildings saved while others aren't? And doesn't being registered on the historic places list protect it from unsympathetic renovations? It turns out, no. There are actually two kinds of designations here in the U.S. that sound similar, but that have very different processes and different results. Anyone can nominate a building for the National Register of Historic Places. There is a review process, but listing here does not restrict the owner. It could only limit them from receiving federal assistance with projects that go against their historical significance. To be considered, it must be at least around 50 years old, which is an arbitrary gauntlet of time to ensure its enduring importance. It must also demonstrate that it looks much like it did originally. While this distinction seems almost honorary or symbolic and bestowed by the National Park Service, the highest level of designation is actually becoming a National Historic Landmark. Landmarks are properties that are deemed significant to all Americans because of their exceptional value or qualities, and they help illustrate or interpret the heritage of the United States. If a property is named a National Historic Landmark, it is also listed on the National Register of Historic Places and able to obtain federal historic preservation funding when available. Only 3% of properties on that National Register of Historic Places are also on the landmarks list, and they're usually owned by private individuals or groups while others are owned by local, state, or tribal or federal government agencies. Today, just over 2,500 historic places have this national distinction. While there are a number of criteria for historical significance that apply, the one that's most important for us talking about the design of architecture is this one. Structures that embody the distinguishing characteristics of an architectural type specimen, exceptionally valuable for the study of a period, style, or method of construction, or that represent a significant, distinctive, and exceptional entity whose components may lack individual distinction. Once designated, landmark status both prevents alterations that are incompatible with the original structure, and it might help to secure federal funds for its restoration and its upkeep. But all these criteria are of course qualitative and subjective and not clearly definable. Criteria like significance or distinctiveness and exceptionality are they're difficult to prove and to distinguish. And restrictions to altering these buildings often focus on things that are outwardly visible, so that buildings look like it did when its significance was established. This sometimes leads to unintended consequences, like something called facadism, where just the facades are saved to maintain the character of a neighborhood. Meanwhile, the rest of the building is completely different and often even conflicting. Like this street where I'm at, which is called the Maxwell Street in Chicago, it was once a vibrant neighborhood and it was wiped away and substituted for student bars and burger places. But at the same time, examples like the Portland building could have been torn down if not for its renovation, which ultimately led to its losing its historic register status. A building needs to evolve over time, and at the same time it needs protection from too hasty alteration. And notably, none of those criteria for those lists are about beauty or likability. This brings me to another bias that we encounter time and time again, and that has to do with our perception of what is worthy and significant relative to the time frame from which we're viewing it. Anecdotally, buildings that are around 40 years old tend to look old and dated. It's almost as an unspoken rule of architecture. And it's not just me either. There are countless examples of buildings that right around that 40 year mark where the ideas of demolition starts to creep into people's minds. Then by the time a building is 50 years old, the battle really begins. This is certainly not a new phenomenon. My friend Will Quam, the brick expert, calls it the 50-year curse. This building behind me, for instance, is called the Monadnock Building in Chicago. It's the tallest brick structure in the world, designed by Burnham and Root in 1893. It is by all measures a significant building, taught to every architecture student in their history courses, but over its lifespan, it's actually gone through more than one round of obsolescence. In 1926, it was still 90% full of tenants, but then by 1937, it was half empty. It was during a recent building boom that flooded the market with more modern options, and the owners of the Monadnock building considered selling it or even tearing it down. But in 1938, 45 years after its construction, it underwent its first large-scale renovation of any skyscraper in order to halt the destruction of Chicago's aging skyscrapers. 
As part of this renovation, they restyled the entrance, remodeled the lobby and ground floor shops, and covered the mosaic floor on the ground level with rubber tiles and terrazzo, as well as enclosed the elevators and the ornamental stairways, and they removed the marble and oak finishes in the corridors and offices with, and replaced them with more modern materials. By all accounts, the renovation worked. But of course, all these renovations made the building more generic by removing everything that was special about it architecturally. The building remained viable financially, but at what cost? That was until exactly 40 years later, when in 1979, the building was emptying again, and the renovation was showing its age. They decided to put the building up for sale, and William Donnell bought it for $2 million. Since then, Donnell vowed to restore the building back to its original condition, remaking the mosaic floors, uncovering the stairways, and bringing back the unique qualities of each unit as they come on the market. He's even gone so far as to carefully select the retailers on the ground level, and then new ones include a tobacco shop, a men's clothier, and a hat shop. But not all buildings find their loving stewards like Donnell found them in Adnock. The Prentice Women's Hospital, for instance, here in Chicago, met its fate with the wrecking ball back in 2014. By all accounts, the concrete cloverleaf structure met all the criteria for landmarking that I could ever imagine. It's significant, it's distinctive, and exceptional. I mean, just look at this image of it. And I've already made a video about the Thompson Center, which will likely meet a similar fate. So I hope that people can keep in mind that being likable by the public is not the same as significant, and that beauty is not the same as exceptional. And what we like or appreciate today might very well be colored by our 50-year blind spot in building appreciation, that point at which it's old enough to need renovation, but not enough to be historical, right at this time when architectural ideas tend to look dated before we can appreciate their novelty. A portion of this video is sponsored by Atlas VPN, who is running a bang and deal for Cyber Month December. Atlas VPN keeps your internet connection secure and opens features reserved for only parts of the world, like watching Rick and Morty on Netflix. Use the special link in the description for three months free and for only $1.39 per month after. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribe to the channel. You might enjoy some of these other videos which come out every Thursday. See you over there.